Um, the next presentation is Genetic Improvements of Anthuriums and Orchids by Dr. Tracy Matsumoto, another well-known face to the growers. Tracy Matsumoto was born and raised in Hilo, Hawaii. Her love for agriculture began washing dishes for the family tissue culture farm. She obtained her BS at UH Hilo studying tissue culture under Dr. Michael Tanabe developing disinf disinfestation procedures for anthuriums. She obtained an additional tissue culture certification from Dr. Toshio Murashige at UC Riverside and completed her master's under Dr. Heidi Kun Kun Kunli at UH Manoa on zygotic and somatic embryogenesis in anthurium. Tracy obtained her PhD from Purdue University and started working for USDA ARS in 2002 as a research horticulturist. In 2015, she was appointed to research leader of the Tropical Plant Genetic Resources and Disease Research Unit and works to develop and foster collaborations between USDA ARS, UH Manoa CTAR, and UH Hilo CAFNRM to help the ornamental industry in Hawaii. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And so um, today I'm going to talk to you or just give you a brief update about the genetic improvement projects that we're doing, um, kind of building off of, of Tessie's program. And what we're doing is doing a more of a, a genetic transformation strategy. And so um, this is where we use existing cultivars that are developed, and then we can just modify a single trait. And so, um, so I'm going to give you a lot of uh, background info. And so um, just to give you a short summary on the virus resistant material. So what we did is we had received uh, material from Tessie's lab that were, was material that was transformed to be uh, virus resistant. And so what we did is we uh, got a material transfer agreement um, from Tessie. We we're able to bring the material over to Hilo. And what we did is we have some of it in culture and we also uh, took some out to the greenhouse where we made sure that we tested to make sure that we still had the um, presence of the transgene. And then right now, the next steps, so right now they're kind of, actually they're kind of bigger <laughs> right now, but so they're, they're ready for virus testing. And so um, one of the possible uh, collaborators would be uh, maybe Mike Shintaku to come over and, and actually test, test the varieties, so, okay. And so that's kind of the summary for that. And then this, if you remember from um, last year, so we're going to take you through <laughs> this process again. So what we do is we have developed a, a, a pipeline. And so we have, um, we're fortunate to have scientists with very different um, special, specialties. And so what we did is, uh, as if you all remember uh, Dr. Gonzalves, he always wanted us to make like a pipeline. And so one day we had to do a presentation, so I literally made a pipeline for him. <laughs> and so basically we have the different aspects that we're trying to improve. One of it is bacterial blight resistance uh, with Dr. Lisa Keith, nematode resistance with uh, Dr. Rexana Myers, and we're getting new traits with Dr. John Suzuki. And so what um, I do with, along with our lab with Donna is basically we do the transformation multiplications and then we give them back to the researchers so that they can further evaluate. Okay, and then um, okay, as we'd said before, before if you notice there's a pressure valve right there. <laughs> and so before Dr. G would be the person that could adjust pressure, but now of course we, we put Eric there <laughs> in his place. <laughs> So, <laughs> okay, <laughs> but nice, nicely, right? <laughs> so um, basically just, I, I wasn't sure how many people were here last year or how many people, uh, what your, you know, level is and or comfort is with um, plant transformation. But basically what we're looking at is genes um, that are delivered into a, with a specific trait in mind. So we have our DNA. We use um, agrobacterium, which is a naturally occurring soil bacteria, and we transform these um, somatic embryos, and then we result in plantlets. Okay. And so just to review what a gene structure is, so if you guys all go back to your biology 101, <laughs> you remember a gene is composed of a promoter, and that's what 
tells the gene when to turn off, when to turn on. So that's why it's on your eyes, you know, your hair or something. Or it can be what we call a constitutive promoter, which is always on all the time. And so then we also have the coding sequence. And the coding sequence is just to say, what is being produced? What protein are we making? What transcript, you know, just what is being produced. And the terminator is kind of just to say, okay, stop. This is where you end your transcription. Okay, so what we did is we were fortunate to have uh, very good collaborators. And so one of our collaborators is Roger Thilmany, and he's at the Western Regional Research Center in Albany. And so he's a USDA scientist, and he works a lot with maize and rice, which are nice because they're monocots. And so uh, the anthuriums and the orchids are also monocots. And so basically, what we're able to do is he gave us a lot of his different genes. So you can see there's a maize on the top, uh, rice ubiquitins on the next two, and then we have some other um, varieties, um, other promoters. And the other one to notice is this is the cauliflower mosaic or 35S promoter, which is very, very commonly used in dicot plants. Okay, so what we do is basically, so promoters determine the expression of the gene, as we had covered before. So, as the comic says there, they go expressing themselves again. <laughs> so that, that's the job of the promoter. So the promoter is a really important part of your gene structure. Okay. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to do a fast test, because as you all know, anthuriums take a while, orchids take a while to grow. And so what we wanted to do is just a quick and dirty how does this work in the plant material? And so how we can achieve this is we do um, a biolistic transformation where basically we just shoot, sh we're just shooting the DNA into the plant tissue. And so here you can see we use gas. There's a rupture disc here. There's a macrocarrier that's actually holding the DNA that's been encoded onto uh, glass, um, I mean, I'm sorry, gold particles. And there's a pressure It'll release at a certain pressure, and then um, there's a stopping screen to keep the gold particles from going in, but the rest of the DNA just shoots into your leaf tissue. Okay. So then what we do is then we leave the tissue out for a couple days, then we um, incubate it into a substrate, which is uh, something that turns blue. So if the gene is in there, it's being expressed, it turns blue. How much expression is given or how, how well the promoter works, you want more blue. So if it's a weak promoter, you'll get a light blue. If it's a strong promoter, you get a very strong, vibrant blue. And so here you can see some leaf tissue that we remove the chlorophyll with the ethanol. And you can see the cauliflower mosaic virus up in the top corner, and you can see very light blue dots. So because this is optimized for dicots, that's why you don't see as high of an expression in, in the monocot system. The right rice actin, a little bit better. Um, the rice cytochrome C, eh, <laughs> there's some pretty good ones. But when you get to the maize ubiquitin and the rice ubiquitin genes, you can really see that the, the, it's really dark blue. And so these are promising promoters. And then, um, as Roxana's interested in, <laughs> so Roxana doesn't really care about the leaves, she's a nematologist, so she cares about the roots. And so basically what you can see is bombarded into the roots, you'll see a nice expression with the ubiquitin promoters. Okay. Except when, um, so these are your tissues um, grown in culture. So Roxana was like, well, let's see what, what, what area it's expressed in. <laughs> so. We we'll have a little bit for, more for her. So that was kind of a what we call a transient expression assay. So just a quick and dirty, how does it work in the plant? But what we want, or what the growers want, is we want something that's more stable, something that um, is incorporated into the genome. As you propagate the plant, it'll continue to grow and propagate there. And so what we use is we use a crown gall, or Agrobacterium tumefaciens. So it's a natural occurring bacteria that actually just makes crown galls. So what it does is it transfers part of the tDNA into the plant and to tell the plant to produce food. 
So what it does is it kind of engineers the plant to produce food for itself. So kind of smart. <laughs> and so what we do is basically um, it will form these crown galls. So what we, what, well actually what Roger did was basically he took the tDNA and what, what, what you do is you replace the genes that are made to produce the agrobacterium's food and you replace it with genes of interest. So in this case, what we used is we used uh, proteins that are antibacterial. So the bacteria was the first thing that we were uh, concentrating on because as Roxana will tell you, is that if we give her plants that are nematode resistant, then they'll succumb to the blight anyway. So it's kind of a bummer. <laughs> so basically, if we get the bacterial resistance first, then she would be better able to evaluate the effects of nematode genes. And so that was the first uh, thing that we were attempting. So we have two different anti or microbial genes, which are sacropins, and they're actually called D2A21 and D4E1. The interesting thing about these is um, I, was just, I did a fresh literature search, and they're actually using this for people diseases. They're expressing it and using it to, um, to control like chlamydia and things like that. So, they are very effective antimicrobial peptides. And then to be sure that our, how our transformation system works, we also did the same um, promoters, but using a GUS, which is the thing that makes the blue color. And this is so that we can track the expression when it goes from the lab to the greenhouse. Because as you know, biological systems sometimes are resistant to things, so you can have times where a plant is like, well, hey, you're producing too much of this gene, so let's turn you off. Because, hey, I don't recognize you, I don't see what your function is, we'll turn you off. So different things can happen, the genes can get methylated, things can happen. So this was just a way for us to track the progress of the gene. <laughs> okay, so in, so then, um, so Donna did a lot of transformations and she was able to get these nice expression um, so these are stably transformed plants in tissue culture. And so you can see that the bright, the blue color is very, very vibrant in all of the tissues tested. Um, the reason why you don't see more blue down the petiole is basically because that's how far the substrate could penetrate. So um, wherever the substrate could penetrate, you'll see that dark blue stain. And so these are the actual antimicrobial peptides that were given to us by another collaborator at the ARS in Albany, and that's Dr. Bill Belknap. And so he had used these for potatoes against um, Ir Irwinia. And then basically you can see that the transgenic potatoes did not get that soft rot. Okay, so what we did is then we tested the genes from culture and we did a PCR test and what the PCR test is is just to say is your gene incorporated in, into the plant and so that's a way of us checking that it's still there. Okay. And so um, Donna had done some in vitro inoculations with these and so basically so she, get, she got the um, xanthom xanthomonas XAD and she inoculated them in culture. And so we did find that some of them were, um, were more resistant. And what she did is, as the new leaves are being formed, uh, she cut those off and then plated those to see, is the bacteria able to propagate in the plant? And so what you can see is, it's kind of hard to see the contrast against the white. So the, the media is actually white, but if you see the um, xanthomonas, it, it's this, uh, almost fluorescent yellow color. And so these are untransformed ones that were infected with the bacteria. And you can see that when you take the next newest leaf that you'll still get a lot of bacteria in it, which means the bacteria was able to penetrate into the tissue, propagate, and then go, go into the new, new, new leaf. Whereas these transgenic lines, some of them better than others, but they were able to kind of stop the bacteria from replicating. Okay, so what we did is she
plants uh, were still alive. And so then she did a second test. And then right now um, what she's doing is she's kind of plating it out to see um, how the bacterial resistance is in those. But it is, it's looking very, very promising. And we also um, verified that these plants also have the transgene. And so the transgene is still there as well as um, it seems to be a little bit more blight resistance. So yeah, so it lo it's looking good. <laughs> So for the next steps, so basically what uh, she did, so this is actually hot off the presses, <laughs> and this is, um, so what we did is we looked at the root for, uh, for the roots, and then what you can see is, so she did a longitudinal and she did a cross section. So Roxana, they're all blue. <laughs> so, um, so this gene or this promoter is what is going to be used for um, Roxana's um, anti-nematode gene or nematocyte gene. So, so that's kind of in the pipeline as well. So this, this is the uncontrolled. These are the controls which um, yeah, don't have any blue stains. And then these are the, the, the blue stains of the transgenic. So the non-transgenic and the transgenic. And then, so then, what's the next steps from, for these? And so what we're going to do is now multiply these um, more, and then now we can hand them off to Lisa and Lionel. <laughs> and so just to go through, um, so these are slides from Lisa. And so she'll, they've kind of, they've done a lot of work on actually testing the um, bacterial blight resistance in the field. And so this is, these are some of her slides. And so this is your typical symptoms of the bacterial blight, which you can see the typical water soaking. And so basically her inoculation methods is to grow it out on, in culture and then make a suspension. And then um, they compare the infiltration of the bacteria um, and spraying the plants with the bacterial suspension. So when it gets to their point, they're dealing with um, a lot larger scale or more, more plants, yeah, where we just test more, more single line type of thing. And so you can see the results of the infiltration where basically you're pushing the bacteria into the leaf and you can see the water soaking in these spots here. Okay, so after infiltration, you'll see the um, necrosis or the bacteria starting to break down the, the cells. And then so um, what you'll do is you see that the symptoms actually go outside of where, where, um, where they did the initial infection. So you can tell that the bacteria is propagating and moving out into the, to the remaining tissues. And then this is the effect of sprays. So you can see the um, water soaking along the hydrothode region, so which is where the, the bacteria is able to penetrate into the plant. And so this is, you also see the necrosis. So this is kind of more of the typical symptoms that you would see in the field. Okay, so for testing of lines, um, basically she used um, spray inoculations. I think just because you can get, test a whole lot more, a whole lot faster, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so basically um, you wound the leaves, but you cut with sterile scissors to decrease the time for symptom development, and this is just would be mimicking when you go and you cut flowers either for sanitation or for harvesting. And so basically they, they um, did a 10-week test, the plants are rated every week, and there's always the untransformed controls with all of her tests. So um, they do have a symptom rating on how, how severe the disease is, resistance is. So you go all the way from um, just water soaking to plant death. And so basically, it's almost like a plant meltdown. And so they also have an um, enhanced disease re scale where they also look at um, how many leaves are actually lost from the plant. Okay. And so here you can see the cut where they put it. You see the water soaking develop and you can see the, the symptoms. Okay. 
And so these are the sprayed. So you can also see the necrosis. Okay, and then at one point, um, basically it goes through the, what it will happen is the bacteria will enter the wound site, it'll go through the plant, it'll be, be translocated in the uh, stem, and then you'll eventually see that it goes systemic, and then it'll die. So, yeah, mm, sad. <laughs> Difference between pathologists and horticulturists, I think this is the, I'm like, oh. <laughs> okay, and um, I just want mahalo to the group because this is this is truly a, a group effort and everybody working together to to uh, do this. Um, majority of the work that I presented is done by Donna, and sorry, Lino, I <laughs> couldn't find a photo of you. <laughs> so, but um, Lino Lino works with Lisa and he does she does all of the uh, the screening as well, and we also work with uh, Lisa Keith is our pathologist, Roxana Myers our nematologist. Uh, John is our molecular biologist, and you can see um, our co collaborators, Bill Belknap and Roger Thilmany. So, and of course, you always see Dr. So, with that, does anyone have any questions? No? So, oh. silly question. Yeah. Great work. Uh, yeah, exciting. We, 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 we're out of the the lab now, yeah? Yeah. We're, we're in yeah. the greenhouse. So the, you're going to be propagating these plants. Uh, they're going to come out to the greenhouse to grow out, to yeah. get field tested. Yeah. Out. So basically right now, because we have the promising results, I'm actually going to start the APHIS application because now we have, because these are new constructs, now we have to make a, a brand new APHIS application. And so um, once we get that in order, and then um, Donna will be multiplying those. And so hopefully, um, we'll follow the similar process like the first time. Yeah, twenty acres. It'll go through the USDA permitting. We get the plants, take them out of vitro, yeah. and then go into the field. Yeah. So, but before, so we have to apply to US APHIS, and then APHIS will um, defer to uh, HDOA to to see if they have any comments and and change. I mean, if they agree with the permit conditions, and then from there we'll have. Um, I would think it would be mo more similar to what we had before, but um, I guess you never know, yeah, because it'll be a new new application process. So, so. The, these plants that are um, have received the genes and it's similar to the first process, it's considered GMO? Yeah. So it's still considered GMO, that's yeah. why you're going through the permit process? Yeah, because the, um, the, the genes are actually coming from rice, the promoters are from rice, the, um, the genes are actually from the Sokopan moth and pupa so it's um yeah so it's not unfortunately it's not like when they do the um, crispr or if they do all sometimes they do all the same genes the genes from the same plant species and things so yeah. thanks wow <laughs>